Before we begin, the one quote that we're about to read from an editorial in the British Medical Journal can have massive repercussions. Henceforth, I want to caveat this, that correlation is not a proof of causation and further studies are required to either validate or not in reference to the particular hypothesis presented here in the editorial. Again, I appreciate the opinion. I don't want to add any publisher bias to this, so let me just begin right now. If there's any immunologists out there, immunologists, uh, those studied in this particular field, please feel free to chime in and make your concerns noted. Quote, sky-high antibodies, starting right here, after vaccination in people who were previously infected may have contributed to these systemic side effects. Most people who are previously ill with COVID-19 have antibodies against the spike protein. To reiterate, most people who are previously ill with COVID-19 have antibodies against the spike protein. If they are subsequently vaccinated, those antibodies and the products of that vaccine or the vaccine can form what are called immune complexes, which may get deposited in places like the joints, meninges, which are looking at brain tissue or connective tissue, and even kidneys creating symptoms, which would explain quite a bit. Again, correlation is not causation, but as we review through the studies we look at tonight, there's a really strong one as far as in reference to what to expect uh, in reference to the most common side effects of each particular type of vaccine. And arthralgia, myalgia, uh, basically you're looking at a particularly large number of reactions or headache, fatigue, you get the picture. All right, but let us begin with the research as follows. Hang on. Apologize about the brief pause, but here we go, as far as what we're also covering tonight. Uh, also to let me begin with the caveat, as we before we look into the VAERS database, it is, let me make this a little larger, just in case we haven't rendered to 4K yet. While very important monitoring vaccine safety, VAERS reports alone cannot be used to determine if a vaccine caused or contributed to an adverse or event or illness. These reports may contain information that is incomplete, inaccurate, coincidental, or unverifiable. This VAERS data is good for the VAERS database. Uh, Dura Vigilance, which is the European database, has not been updated in over a week. We don't know why. But let us continue with our other articles as follows. We will be covering as begin. COVID-19 in Sweden, Norway, and Finland suspend the use of Moderna vaccine in young people as a precaution. A quite interesting gossip here in the British Medical Journal. The UK was advised to stockpile PPE and screen travelers in 2016 after coronavirus modeling. That's a little bit of Nostradamus type stuff. The article which we just read uh, from the editorial is as follows. Vaccinating people who have had COVID-19, why does it natural immunity count in the U.S.? Important. A lot of data can be gleaned from this one particular research article, uh, but it is wonderfully written and attempts to give both sides of the argument. But however, though, depending, it could be just bias or not, uh, one side of the argument will have overwhelming, um, how to describe it, validity. And the other one seems to be more just bias. You'll see in a second. You'll, you'll get to that point. We'll get there. All right, number, another one, number four. Uh, this is why the British Medical Journal has gone ballistic on the New England Journal of Medicine. And it's worthy of note, especially after we get done reviewing this article. Uh, yes, uh, I wanted to validate the certain individuals. Yes, Moderna was also recalled uh, in Japan after metal fragments were found in the vaccine itself. Uh, we'll cover that briefly. Immune response to COVID-19 vaccine different with prior infection. A uh, real important article. I'll make it a little bit bigger right now, just so it's this again. So when it does run to the, if it does run to 4K right away, you'll still get a chance to read a little bit of it, a little bit of it. And then also too, this article here in reference to basically each vaccine tends to have slightly different uh, effects associated with it. So this will give you at least a really good idea what to expect uh, often in reference to likelihood of a potential reaction and what type of reaction is associated with which vaccine. Then uh, briefly, um, a real good article on COVID's crushing impact on public health as far as lockdowns and things like that. That's going to be brief. Well, that'll just take a few seconds to cover. Um, immunity is the SARS COV-2 up to 15 months after infection. 
this has an intriguing observation in here, really intriguing observation, which we'll get to and look at it again. Again, these are preprints. They need peer review. And again, some of these statements and outcomes are so profound, I definitely will feel better if it's validated through other venues. Right now, uh, as far as observation-wise on my side, there's a major ebb and flow in reference to um, not an argument against vaccination, what per se, it, but however, though, questions are beginning to openly arise as the researchers are less fearful of being uh, bemoaned, uh, censored, and so on and so forth. So now a lot of valid questions are coming out and a lot of observations are coming out, but they're hidden in the research. You have to read the research in order to find those fine lines, which make huge statements buried in the research itself. We'll get to this one in a second. Also, too, we'll be looking at, uh, let's get this one right off the bat. All right, this one, let's just get out of the way. Uh, the breakthrough SARS CV-2 infections of 620,000 U.S. veterans between February 1st and August 13th, 2021. And basically what it's going to come down to is this. It's the waning protection of the vaccines. But uh, we all know that's being uh, correlated with a lot of other studies per se. But this one in particular uh, showed a major drop in the Janssen. By August, protection against infection had declined to 3%. And of course, Moderna 50% and 64%. And that is actually in what is being measured. We don't know about the other elements that are coming out in reference to T cell and B cell memory now, which are changing the dynamics. Like it's not the quantity of T cells, but the quality of T cells and whether those T cells are targeting the right aspect. So let's get this one out of the way. But otherwise, there it is. Moderna went down to 50%. Uh, Pfizer, I believe, went down, no, 60 4% from Moderna and 50% for Pfizer. Please forgive me, I misquote there. Uh, and that's after six months. So you're going to be seeing a lot of boosters in potentially a, um, a biannual, um, you know, ritual per se in reference to inoculation if, if immunity is going to be uh, contained utilizing nothing more than vaccines and not counting on natural immunity. All right. Then we'll go into the various data and so on and so forth. But let's begin right off the bat with the first research article as follows. Again, this was a precautionary note. Uh, we don't want to add publisher bias in reference to it because they're pulling it in order to research it but, and see if there's validity to it or not. COVID-19, Sweden, Norway, and Finland suspend use of Moderna vaccine in young people as precaution. And Sweden, Norway, and Finland suspended the use of Moderna's COVID-19 vaccine on September, September, please forgive me, 7th of October after reports of possible rare side effects. The pause for precautionary reasons in Sweden and Finland concerns anyone born 1991 or later. So what's amazing about this is the range of age that they chose. So when we think this, we hear a lot about it in the news uh, in reference to young people. And so we're thinking, obviously, our bias will be reflected towards 21 or younger, 18 or younger, whatever it is. Uh, in their case, 30 or younger. Uh, basically, so basically, Swedish officials are still discussing the second dose for uh, the 81,000 the 30s who received the first dose of Moderna. So they actually stopped at midpoint. In Norway, officials have suspended the use of Moderna's vaccine in those under 18, advising that they are offered the Pfizer vaccine instead. Uh, again, back and forth. I just want to bring that to your attention because it is information that is valid. And if they're questioning it, then I'd like to see exactly how we are investigating here in the United States to more of a detailed point. Oh, also too, it is now 11.15 p.m. October 16th, 2021. And good evening. We we're a little early today and it'll be morning probably by the time we finish. But hello to our data analysts, data scientists, bioinformatics, epidemiologists, policymakers, and those data oriented audience which we have at hand. And so, good evening. All right, so I'll catch you guys in a bit. Let's go to the next one. Da -da. And there's that. UK was advised to stockpile PPE and screen travelers in 2016 after coronavirus modeling. 
says the government was warned four years before the COVID-19 pandemic of the need to stockpile personal protective equipment, screen travelers, and set up contact tracing system in the event of a major outbreak of a coronavirus, a previously unpublished report has revealed. The government had initially refused to release the report on the grounds it could lead to loss of public confidence in the government's and NH National Health System's COVID-19 response, but eventually released it. Why so secretive? But again, they could have been dealing with the SARS, UV-1, MERS, you know, whatever it was at that time. But still, um, it was intriguing that it was foreseen four years ago in reference to the coronavirus. Just worthy of note. All right, next one. This, here we go. This one is going to be pretty lengthy, so please forgive me, but it covers a lot of hot topics. So this was published 13th of September, 2021. In the British Medical Journal, vaccinating in one of the feature articles, vaccinating people who have had COVID-19. Why doesn't natural immunity count in the U.S.? So again, it's nice to have that international news. The correction here, if you see that, is just a minor correction in reference to a chart in an age range. Not, nothing correction in reference to the data that's presented in the article itself. The U.S. CDC estimates that SARS-CoV-2 has infected more than 100 million Americans, and evidence is mounting that natural immunity is at least as protective as vaccination. Yet public health leadership says everyone needs the vaccine, the British Medical Journal investigates. Remember, British Medical Journal was also the one that broke uh, the conflict of interest in reference to the original SARS-CoV-1 outbreak a long time ago. We still have those articles on file, but to begin. There's some, some highlights, and the links will be there for you to follow as well, so you can delve into your own and not be so reliant on my narration. Go, quote, as more U.S. employers, local governments, and educational institutions issue vaccine mandates that make no exception for those that have COVID-19, questions remain about the science and ethics of treating this group of people as equally vulnerable to the virus or as equally threatening to those vulnerable to COVID-19. And to what extent politics has played a role? Give you a little bit of insight. They are really into basically, uh, they want it to be an argument in reference to the immune and the not immune. Not an argument in reference to the vaccinated and not vaccinated. So they take a little more eclectic approach to it. So it's quite interesting. And so let's proceed. And look at this right here. Only, re, uh, only published, uh, tweeted quite often but on Facebook, just four Facebook pages. So let us begin. Three videos, well now we'll make it four. So here we go. We're just gonna take some excerpts. So please forgive me too, by taking excerpts, uh, we can uh, inadvertently take things out of context. So for the fact checkers out there, uh, which visit the channel from time to time, again, go to the research article itself, validate it. This is medical information being presented by medical professionals, and all I am doing is narrating it. So to begin, just 1% of this was discovered basically as COVID cases surged in Israel this summer. The Ministry of Health reported the numbers by immunity status between July 5th and the 3rd of August. Just 1%, just 1% of new cases were in people who had been previously affected with COVID-19. Given that 6% of the population are previously infected and unvaccinated, these numbers are very low. The data suggests that the recovered have better protection than people who are vaccinated. Oh, it's going to get far more uh, in-depth than that, so here we go. Staying firm. Other countries do give past infections some immunological currency. This is one thing our media out here has not told us. This is that I'm not familiar with. Israel recommends that people who have had COVID-19 wait three months before getting one mRNA vaccine dose and offers a green pass, a vaccine passport to those with a positive serological result regardless of vaccination. Interesting. Now, what happened? Why don't we do that here? Because as we'll cover in a little bit, in May, our glorious FDA decided not to count those tests as being valid for determining prior immunological, uh, how to start defense. In the UK, it's inconvenient, wasn't it? 
Yeah, we heard about all these vaccine passports, but didn't hear about these little uh, exceptions. In the UK, people with a positive polymerase chain reaction PCR test results can obtain the NAH COVID pass up to 180 days after infection. So to proceed. Another researcher highlights real world data, such as the Cleveland Clinic study, real world data, I will reiterate that, and points out that while vaccines are focused on only that tiny portion of immunity, oh, this is gonna get very enlightening as we proceed, that can be induced by the spike. Someone who has had COVID-19 who was exposed to the whole virus, which would likely offer a broader based immunity that'd be more protective against variants. The laboratory study offered by the FDA only has to do with specific antibodies to a very specific region of the virus, the spike. I think the name would be Mamoli. Please forgive me if I've mispronounced. Claiming this as data supporting that vaccines are better than natural immunity is short-sighted and demonstrates a lack of understanding of the complexity of immunity to respiratory virus. This is where I like other immunologists to chime in. Again, uh, the more opinion we get involved in this, the better. To proceed, Gandhi and others have been urging reporters away from antibodies, reporters or researchers, either way, from antibodies as a defining metric of immunity. And that's real important. Quote, it is accurate that your antibodies will go down after a natural infection. To reiterate, something which our you know, infotainment, or I should say our news stations, not to bemoan them, but I'm really, really uh, discouraged by the lack of in-depth reporting. I mean, yeah, there's, they they've do a great job of polarizing, but they don't give the information or the ammunition in detailed footnoted uh, perspective that can yield you a credible uh, hypothesis in reference to whether to or not to. Quote, repeat, it is accurate that your antibodies will go down after a natural infection, she says. That's how the immune system works. If antibodies didn't clear from our bloodstream after we recover from a respiratory infection, our blood would be thick as molasses. The real memory in our immune system resides in the T and B cells, not in the antibodies themselves. He points out, now the researcher, the pediatric rheumatologist at the University of California, LA, he points out that his sickest COVID-19 patients in intensive care, including children with multi-system inflammatory syndrome, have had loads of antibodies. So the question is, why didn't they protect them. Antonio Bertoletti, please forgive me again if I mispronounced, professor of infectious disease at Duke and a U.S. medical school in Singapore, has conducted research that indicates T cells may be more important than antibodies. Comparing the T cell response in people with symptomatic versus asymptomatic COVID-19, Bertoletti's team found them to be identical suggesting that the severity of infection does not predict strength of resulting immunity and that people with asymptomatic infections mount a highly functional virus-specific cellular immune response. Remember we covered that last week? This kind of gives confirmation to what was we uh, covered last week in reference to the asymptomatic fight the virus off so well that what you normally be looking for may not be there. But otherwise, as far as T and B cell, yeah, let us begin. All right, hypothesis. Now, this is interesting. This is the individuals. This is their mentality. And again, taking things out of context can be quite uh, sometimes can elevate bias. But this was said with such, fero uh, how would you say, ferociousness, ferocity, that I think was worthy of a highlight. So let us begin. This is the argument on the other side. Klausner, who is also a medical director of the U.S. testing and vaccine distribution company, and we are going to go into reference to basically what he said. It is a lot easier to put a shot in the arm, says Summer, to do a PCR test or to do an antibody test, and then to give, pro and then to process it, and then to get the information to them, and then to let them think about it. It's a lot easier just to give them the damn vaccine. In public health, 
The primary objective is to protect as many people as you can, he says. It's called collective insurance, and I think it's irresponsible from a public health perspective to let people pick and choose what they want to do. All right. And again, this is basically from Summer, uh, was the quote. Um, you can take it from there. Now, here's the interesting part. A reference to, again, the vaccine passport and prior immunity and why prior immunity seems not to make or prior, you know, potential immunity from prior infection uh, seems not to make a difference to the FDA. It may. The FDA announced that antibody tests should not be used to evaluate a person's level of immunity or protection from COVID-19 at any time. But yet, isn't it quite ironic that they utilize that information to validate emergency use authorization for certain inoculations? food for thought to proceed and that is politics politics and natural immunity again the john snow memorandum written response with signatories including rochelle walensky who went on to head the cdc stated quote there is no evidence for long lasting protective immunity to sars cov-2 following natural infection no evidence there was there no evidence where is that no evidence. Immunity SARS up to 15 months after infection, following natural infection. Uh, but there's no evidence. And they claim we, the people on YouTube, are guilty of selection bias and medical misinformation. So, hmm, no evidence. The statement has a footnote to a study of people who had recovered from COVID-19 showing that blood antibody levels wane over time. Again, here we go. It's not that the evidence that's there, it's what the selection of what they're looking at, there's a particular point in reference to something like the article we just basically looked at. They look at different aspects of the immune system, especially antibodies in reference to resign binding domain. Remember last week in reference to the tests, they said they were looking at the potentially the wrong antibodies. But let us proceed. Here we go. All right. Better safe than sorry. Here is what they said to proceed. Uh, whoop, whoop, almost skipped the point. If you listen to the language of our public health officials, they talk about the vaccinated and unvaccinated. This is a really good delineation, worthy of note as well. If we want to be a scientific, we should talk about the immune and the non-immune. There's a significant portion of the population, McCary says, who are saying, hey, wait, I have had COVID, and they've blown it off and dismissed it. And of course, they also brought into the play um, a lot of other elements into reference to that. And they also you'll find they'll also quoted uh, Biden in reference to that. Better safe than sorry. If natural immunity is strongly protective, as the evidence to date suggests it is, unless you're head of the CDC, then vaccinated people who have had COVID-19 would seem to offer nothing or very little to benefit logically leaving only harms. Both the harms we already know about, as well as those still unknown, said Christine Sebel-Bell, vaccinologist and professor of the global health at the University of Southern Denmark. The CDC has acknowledged the small but serious risk of heart inflammation and blood clots after vaccination, especially in younger people. The real risk in vaccinating people who have had COVID-19 is of doing more harm than good. A large study in the UK and another that surveyed people internationally found that people with a history of SARS-CoV-2 infection experienced greater risk rate, rates forgive me, of side effects after vaccination. Among 2,000 people who have com completed an online survey after vaccination, those with a history of COVID-19 were 56% more likely to experience a severe, not a side effect, a severe side effect that required hospital care. That kind of throws a wrench into the risk-benefit analysis. Patrick Will in UCLA says, quote, and this we, we led with, but I'm going to reiterate now, says that sky-high antibodies after vaccination in people who were previously infected may have contributed to these systemic side effects. Most people who were previously ill with COVID-19 have antibodies against the spike protein. If they are subsequently vaccinated, those antibodies and the products of the vaccine can form what are called immune complexes. He explains, which may get deposited in places like the joints, the meninges, and even the kidneys creating symptoms. To proceed forward, 
Other studies suggest that a two-dose regimen may be counterproductive. One found, and again, this is all footnoted. You see the little footnotes there? One found, and you'll have the links as well, that in people with past infections, the first dose boosted T cells and antibodies. We all heard that, remember? And we heard that quite a bit about a month ago. But the second dose seemed to indicate an exhaustion. And in some cases, even a deletion, even a deletion of T cells. Quoting, to be fair, I'm not here to say that it's harmful, reassuring, says Bertolelli, who co-authored the study. But at the moment, all the data are telling us that it doesn't make any sense to give a second vaccination dose in the very short term to someone who has already been infected. The immune response is already very high. Despite the extensive global spread of the virus, the previously infected population hasn't been studied well as a group says Wayland. Mamoli says he is also unaware of any studies examining the specific risks of vaccination for that group. Still, the U.S. public health messaging has been firm and consistent. Everyone should get a full vaccine dose. When the vaccine was rolled out, the, globe, the goal should have been to focus on people at risk, and that should still be the focus. Such risk stratification may have complicated logistics but it also required more nuanced messaging. A lot of public health people have this notion that the public is told that there's even the slightest bit of uncertainty about vaccine, then they won't get it. This reflects a bygone paternalism. Quoting, I always think it's much better to be very clear and honest about what we do and don't know, what the risks and benefits are, and allow people to make decisions for themselves. Isn't this how the whole debate has turned? I think this is our 53rd week of reviewing all the COVID information. And hasn't the whole thing been about self-determination and autonomy? Uh, and I never, never would have imagined us treating each other so horribly uh, in such a short period of time over something like this, where the questions are can be valid, even censoring each other. And but otherwise, reiterate, I'll have the link there. I mean, even family members turn against each other. Uh, but the link will be there to the British Medical Journal thing and review it on your own, share it. Let's see if it gets reshared more than four times on Facebook. To proceed, this is the article, this is what turned the British Medical Journal off. And this is part of the reason why, if you want, let's put it this way if you want to utilize a little bit of selection bias in why if you're a reporter and your job is to prop up inoculation you know with noble intent you're going to go to the new england journal of medicine why because even as i've been reviewing data i have not seen myself personally any uh you know i would say information recently questioning any of the efficacy in reference to any sort of inoculation. In fact, most of everything I read is positive, which is quite amazing because we've covered quite a few articles which, um, uh, how would you say, paint some shades of gray. But I want to reiterate the information in the British Medical Journal. And this is what kind of turned the British Medical Journal into um, um, basically a question mill to proceed. New England Journal of Medicine editor had close ties with the FDA authorization process when publishing COVID-19 vaccine trials. The editor-in-chief of the New England Journal of Medicine sat on the authorization panels and voted for and for and voted to recommend authorizing Pfizer, Moderna, and Johnson & Johnson. COVID-19 vaccines. After the panels authorized these vaccines, Pfizer and Moderna published their clinical trials in New England Journal of Medicine. The concentration of power. Rubin declared no conflicts of interest to all three vaccine panels. Asked by the British Medical Journal whether he recused himself from the decisions on the New England Journal submissions, quote, overall, we consider the deep involvement of the editors in the medical and research communities to be a strength and not a problem. Now, again, they said this concentration of power should be questioned and debated, to reiterate. But he adds that Rubin should be, have recused himself from the FDA panel if he and had an inkling that the companies would later publish the results in the New England Journal of Medicine. By publishing, the journal stands to benefit in a number of ways. The impact factor of the journal might go up, or this might type 
or this type of high profile study might allow them to charge more for ads in the journal, so on and so forth. So again, that's the British Medical Journal uh, basically approached that a while ago. And if you want to run a little bit of a natural analysis in reference to the number of positive articles in reference to inoculation in the NEGM, as opposed to the negative ones which have been published, never seem to be published in the Neurogonian Journal of Medicine, I'd be really curious to see what you discover. But I respect the New England, New England Journal of Medicine, but I do not uh, feel comfortable with the potential conflict. To proceed as follows. Fears of medical flakes and Moderna vaccine after two deaths. Now, I'm just going to reiterate just part of it. it says, and this was basically published in the Times. Two men with no pre-existing illness died days after receiving the Moderna vaccines from a batch in Japan contaminated with tiny metal flakes. 39 vaccine vials were found to contain the fragments last week at eight centers in five prefectures, including Tokyo. They were part of three batches made by Moderna in Spain. At least 180,000 people are understood to have been injected from those batches. Now, a good question would be, I'd be curious how many of you out there uh, heard this at all? Seriously. Now, it kind of interesting. Now, this is just uh, gossip-wise. You, you think about all those people with the magnetism type thing, you know, whatever. It, it's When I heard this, it defaulted to that. So that was the way my mind went. But again, that's just gossip and nothing else and nothing more. But, you know, uh, metal flakes being recalled. Uh, Japan found them. Link will be there to the, uh, the Times uh, UK uh, article as well for the, uh, for the fact checkers out there just to validate so they feel secure. All right, next. Yeah, here we go. Immune response to COVID-19 vaccine vaccine different with prior infection. Remember about the hypothesis in reference to what may be delving into natural immunity. Here we go. I'm just going to take a few highlights out of this article. They turn to a technology called Cytuf that can measure the levels of nearly 40 different proteins on the surface and inside of T cells. All right. So this is the timing two weeks after and approximately two weeks after the second dose. And so small studies that would have for the, the statisticians out there, it's not going to have a large power factor, so it needs to be probably reiterated or redone. Reiterated. I'll repeat the words again. But they are to be done in a larger group. The Delta virus the variant of the virus is not included in the new in the new paper. To caveat it, in people who had never been infected with SARS-CoV-2, quoting Rowan and her colleagues, found that the T cell response became stronger in both quantity and quality of T cells after the second vaccine dose. However, in those who had previously had a COVID-19 infection, there was little change between the first and second dose of the vaccine. Interesting. Quote, why wouldn't we have detected this difference if we just quantified all the T cells? So you see what they're talking. They're not talking about looking for specific T cells. They're just saying it's not a quantity game. You have to make sure it's the right T cells. It's like having a tool chest with 40 tools, but they're all hammers when you need to cut a two by four to proceed. But Cytif allowed us to pick up these key function, functional differences in T cells in the people who have been previously affected. The potentially more effective T cell defense in the respiratory tract may explain why breakthrough infections are less frequent in people with prior COVID-19 infection compared to other vaccinated individuals. Shall we go back to the quote from the CDC director who said, there is no evidence of any sort of natural immunity, per se. Where was that? Uh, we'll get back to it again. You already get the point. Interesting. All right, but to proceed, back to the article itself. And we'll have the links to that as well. Now, what this primarily is, is a looking at basically most of the non-severe events. Now, when you look at the uh, aspect of the hypothesis of reference to this article again, here and we're looking at potentially um you know the antibodies questions that was brought up in the hypothesis if i could find that here for your example uh let's proceed do, 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 do. yeah right here joints you know tissues connected tissue kidneys and so on and so forth so again i'll have the links here as well 
but it begins to make sense as we scroll down and you'll find the very the very bottom of the of the full published study a thoralgia a myalgia chills fatigue fever this is what to expect from each different type of vaccine you can see for example certain ones have higher elements than others as far as what type of um, uh, effect may occur adverse event that may be get reported again needs to be validated I don't know if this is validated or not so again we're just looking at what we have here and this on the y-axis here is obviously if you look at it that's usually a pretty high percentage this reason right here is probably why a lot of athletes uh, are not exactly thrilled uh, that's an extremely high percentage uh, in reference to uh, inoculation, especially prior to a sporting event, and so on and so forth. But the joint issues and the myalgia, it's, it's intriguing. Again, gray is senior. Uh, obviously, the darker blue is middle age. So look, which is interesting because a lot of the uh, adverse events being reported uh, seem to be higher in the younger groups. Intriguing. Especially this one right here. That, that'd be really curious to understand why the, why that occurs. Again, any immunologist, I mean, feel free to make a comment to reference that. I, I'd be real curious to have any hypothesis whatsoever. All right, next, real brief statement. COVID-related redeployments, this was from uh, COVID's crushing impact on public health. COVID-related redeployments produced significant reductions in several areas, including chronic disease, a 39% reduction in healthcare workers. Maternal child health, 42% decrease. Substance abuse, 28% reduction. Environmental health, 26% reduction. Injury, 37% reduction, as well as 47% decrease in programs focused on HIV, sexually transmitted diseases, health disparity, and others. This was a pretty interesting aspect in reference to just basically burnout and a reallocation of the resources going, going, going towards, as if one, again, it's uh, going towards uh, pandemic mitigation factors. Uh, it's quite compelling when you look at the collateral aspect of the harm caused by um, how it described the lack of attention being paid to other vital arenas as well. To proceed forward, immunity to SARS uh, SARS CoV-2 up to 15 months after infection. We're talking convalescent, and convalescent meaning not necessarily older people that have, are recovering from infection following natural infection. Now, often, again, this is a preprint and needs to be, how I would describe, uh, peer-reviewed. But there's something interesting here which just fascinates me. But here we go. Quote, let's get a little bit of backstory first. We have previously reported that longevity of the SARS-CoV-2 adaptive immune response up to six to eight months. In cohorts of Swedish and Italian patients infected with SARS-CoV-2 you remember this strain, the G614 strain, like one of the original ones a long time ago? The antibody neutralizing teeters, titers, were sustained at a relatively high, teeters, titers, yeah, relatively high level for at least six months after the onset of symptoms, which tells me the CDC had to know this. So I don't know where they came up with that comment. Not the CDC as a whole, uh, some of the bureaucratic leadership of the CDC. Uh, seriously. While specific memory B and T cells, here we go, were maintained for at least six to eight months. In this study, the adaptive immune response in convalescent patients from the same cohorts, so the same people, was followed up to 15 months. All right, but here comes the interesting aspect. Ready? Here we go. This I can't figure out, but I want to bring it to your attention because I want to share it. Here we proceed. We further compared the antibody response induced from natural infection to that induced by one or two doses of the Pfizer or BioTech vaccine. Different names, different countries. The vaccine, ready? The vaccine induced no, no, as in none, or a low level receptor binding domain in S specific immunoglobulin N and immunoglobulin A antibody tiers compared to those detected during natural infection. The plasma RBD and S specific immunoglobulin G antibody tiers. I want to say titers measured 14 to 35 days after one dose of the vaccine was similar to those measured in patients more than six months after infection. And to go give to context after the second vaccine, they were about similar. Uh, but let's look at figure 2D2J. I don't know why they have it under figure three, but just to give you an idea, that 
Is there anything else here? Oh, here. Wait, wait. Now it's here. I'm going to read this first, then we'll look at those figures. Ready? No statistically significant differences were observed in the number of memory B cells between mild, moderate, and severe critical COVID-19 patients over the period ranging from 6 to 15 months, suggesting the intensity and duration of the B cell response are not dependent on disease severity. That's been reiterated quite a bit in a lot of studies. Non-infected individu- individu- uh, non-infected individuals sampled 14 to 35 days after the first vaccine dose showed a B cell response significantly lower than those observed in convalescent patients between 3 and 15 months. After the onset of symptoms, subjects sampled 14 to 36 days of second dose showed a median number of circulating receptor binding domain specific memory B cells similar to those observed in convalescent patients sampled. So basically pretty close after the second dose. I'll make sure there's nothing else here and then we're going to go to the little chart. Yeah, nothing else here. Let's go to that chart. So the chart of the no, the no. So here we go. To repeat as we go back up, do, 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 do. the vaccine induced no or low level RBD and S specific immunoglobulin M and immunoglobulin A. Well, I hope those aren't very important compared to those during natural infections. So where's figure two? Now remember, 2D, 2J, 2E, and 2K. So here we are. So we have figure two right there. What's it look like? Da da da. There you are. Up. Oh, where's 2, 2E? Right there. There's your antibody RBD, immunoglobulin A, and gosh darn it, can't get that out of the way. And so there's your charts. Like, what the heck? You see that okay, right? I mean, I hope this is rendered by 4K by the time you see it. But again, immunologists, this is something for you to comment on because that's the difference between natural infection and vaccine-induced infection. It's not, a, it's not an argument against the realm of vaccination as a form of medicine. It is basically a challenge to develop better inoculations. So that's quite intriguing, I would say, right there. I don't want to click on it if I click on it. So look at 2E right there. Um, if I click on it, it's going to go away. Yeah, of course it went away. So you see what I mean? Uh, let's go back. You see right there, 2E and 2D compared to your natural infections. If you look at D, for example, right at the top, 7 to 14, 50 to 20, 29 90, that's a difference. Why did natural infection induce that, but inoculation did not to proceed? And here we go. This is the breakthrough infections. Again, this is one we covered to the veterans. And um, so if someone, for example, had the Janssen uh, in their infection, this is after six months, 50% for the uh, Moderna, 64% for the, I um, sorry, 64% for Moderna, please forgive me, 50% for Pfizer, and 3% protection for Janssen and Janssen. Uh, you can probably pretty much guarantee they're going to keep on calling it boosters, but if, if basically SARS CoV 2 maintains a concern over time and they keep on demanding, vaccines and they keep on coming up with this data uh, yeah you can see what's going to go is so it's good uh, it's interesting and if there's a new variant then that's a whole different uh, ball game but what's the sense if an individual past six months can you count truly at a three percent are you going to count on that as being protective if you go into a nursing home or something like that or if you're here in california now you have if we want to vet, visit someone in a nursing home or healthcare facility our illustrious governor made it certain that, for example, that you would mandatory you to show proof of, um, of, uh, you know, no exposure or no or no COVID nineteen, or you must be vaccinated. But if you're vaccinated, you don't have to show uh, immunological proof that you don't have COVID nineteen. But yet, if the vaccine only yields you a limited amount of protection, then what are you doing? Virtue signaling. All right, to proceed. All right, now let's get into the data itself. Again, I'm going to reiterate uh, the VAERS data. Da, 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 da. Let's go here. Again, these are just reports to VAERS, not reports from VAERS. Uh, so basically, it's not confirmed. So all because you have this pile of data there, it's not confirmed. But however, also too, this also goes for the European database. Now, an interesting thing about the Edura Vigilance, it has not been very vigilant. So reason being, they have not updated their data 
since October 9th. For those not familiar with the European dating systems, the month is in the middle. So October 9th, they have been not updating anything. So remember last time we had a little data anomaly with also this strange drop in reported mortality. And now it looks like the system has happened with us too, with the VAERS database, but now it's happened with the Adura Vigilance database. Uh, so we'll not be covering that one today. And again, our data sources before we see are going to be look at the data we look at is GSIA, uh, our world and data, uh, CDC, obviously. And so let us begin. Here we go. Ba, ba, ba. All right. Zip file size. Oh, before we go in, the zip file size for, for just for the fact checkers out there. Here we go. 2021, the zip file is 139 megabytes. You see this megabyte size? That's not accumulation. That is basically just all the data collected on adverse events being reported to VARES from January to this October 8th. All right. So it's 139 megabytes. We're at right now. So just so you can validate the data, don't need to believe me, but I want to show you the comparison just, just to see. So 139 megabytes. All the past 30 years, all the data compiled and all the adverse events reported to VARES and the zip file size is 123 megabytes. Now you can tell I'm using the zip file size as our benchmark, 123 megabytes. Compared to just all the data accumulated from January 1st of 2021 to this October 8th of 139 megabytes zip file. That yields us, you wanna look at it this way? That's your comparison. File size difference, all right? So now we're at 17 megabytes larger than we were for the, all the 30 years prior. And that is exactly 14% greater than the three decades prior of reports being filed with this VARES in reference to uh, being reported to VARES and maintained by the CDC. So that's your file comparison size, just as a heads up. But again, remember the disclaimer. To proceed now with the disclaimer as follows, ba ba ba. All right, here we go to VARES. I'm trying to make it a little faster so it's easier to see. These are the reports of interest submitted to VARES. Again, it's up to the CDC, provided they have the personnel to validate the information, again, to see what is accurate and what is not. As far as reports, these are reports as whole. We're looking at 3,574 reports to uh, VARES in reference to thrombocytopenia. 4,590 reports to VARES in reference to CERVA, 5,451 reports to VARES in reference to paralysis, 5,708 reports to VARES in reference to myocarditis. We'll look at the age range again. 6,233 reports to uh, VARES in reference to Bell palsy, 7,658 deaths reported to VARES, uh, again, have to be validated, um, obviously in reference to death. 8,813 reports to VARES in reference to thrombosis. 16,901 reports, I assume that'd be shingles reactivation, reports to VARES in reference to shingles. And 86,619 reports to VARES in reference to COVID. And I would assume those reports were reference to potentially breakthrough infections since, in, since mRNA doesn't have anything to cause an infection, uh, but otherwise, you know, potentially vaccinated and exposure later on, who knows? Uh, but again, to proceed. So let's go up to the top real fast and then we'll go down. So I'm not gonna spend much time in reference to, you know, covering anything in particular. So again, Let's go look if we can find myocarditis. If people want to read these, uh, you can. They're there. It's anybody can can read these. Uh, for example, after vaccination, patient tested positive for COVID nineteen. Patient was very ill, had numerous chronic health issues prior to vaccination. So you can read all these. You know, in fairness, so it's not just being taken out of context. Um, so you know the age range and so on and so forth. Anybody that has any background in data can easily pull us up. 
And also, too, just a side note, too, for data analysts out there, you want to make sure, since they now have mixed data types in the pandas, oh, no, just in the pandas, in the data frames, uh, be sure to make sure the encoding is Latin and low memory is false. So those fact checkers out there, which are experienced in data analytics, that will help you check what we're reviewing, all right, to proceed. And again, the CDC has made some mistakes, which uh, we've been fortunate enough to help um, bring back into reality. Here we go. Myocarditis reaction by age, it's still very low. So that gives you an idea. Uh, and there's your report, so on and so forth. Again, we're now going to go back that down. Uh, bah, bah, bah. Vaccine batches. Uh, yeah, this is the different types of vaccine. You want to see the vaccine adverse events being reported to in reference to each vaccine. There's that. We can look at that right there. Vaccine reactions reported to VAERS as of actually it's October 8th is 611,410. And reports by age, pretty interesting uh, bell curve there. Uh, again, that needs to be validated. Da, da, da. Da, baby, I'm going to move very fast. Let's see. Any more? All right. That is 2021 uh, vaccine adversity reports to VAERS. If I emphasize that, you understand why. As compared to all of 2020. So 611,410 reports to VAERS as opposed to 2020, 57,115. Uh, remember when we first started doing that? It was like 300% greater. We're like we're amazed. Now it's just, it, it's, it's just ridiculous. To proceed. Uh, again, these are the reports you want to read. They're, they're not, you know, misguided people making these reports. These are very, very uh, telling reports. All right, now we'll do. All right, here's our most, I'm just gonna, most common symptoms word cloud. Right here, it's a lot easier to see. Most common symptoms currently represented are popping up uh, in all ages. Again, regardless or irregardless of the vaccine. Uh, there's the myalgia. Remember, we talked about that. Uh, they must talk about joint pain here. It's interesting how that doesn't pop up, but we'll see if, I don't know why it's not being reported, but that is. And uh, let's continue forward. Uh, ba, 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 right there. These are mortality in infants, in individuals that have succumbed that got recorded to VARES. That's the most common reasons why. Uh, here we are. It's again, correlation is not causation, but it's worthy to note what's going on. A lot of, lot of, um, now that's interesting. Again, we remember the British Medical Journal, uh, or it's the connected tissue around the uh, protecting the brain, the meninges. Uh, that's interesting. Uh, but otherwise, outside of that, proceed. I don't want to add publisher bias. So again, you, you can read between the lines. Uh, da, da, da. Reports by lot numbers. This is in children. Uh, most common reports, according to the child reports, reported to VARES. That's interesting. Um, you know, again, that's been reported to VARES, requires confirmation. And so that's the most common things. And let's just see real fast. Da, da, da. Nothing unusual, nothing unusual, nothing unusual. And we conclude down here just to give you an idea. All right, next. We are going to look at ba, 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 the states. There we go. Mortality breakdown. Here's our age breakdown reported from the CDC. Uh, you can get an idea. Thank goodness not very many children have, uh, I mean, every life is precious. and But it's not as high as may have been predicted. But thank goodness it's not. And so that's what we're looking at. As far as age ranges, uh, reported from the CDC, and I just broke it down in graph way, graph wise. Da, da, da. All right, we're going to scroll down. I ah, forget about that, forget about that, forget about that. Let's just go straight to see exactly how. Oh, check this out. Ready? Now look at this. Now, outside of obvious potential algorithmic patterns of one, two, three, one, two, three, it's not necessarily seasonal. It it's more time-wise. So if anybody can actually come up with a machine learning model to basically pay attention to these small patterns, that'd be great. 
But how effective has all these lockdowns been? So if we go back to the very beginning of the pandemic per se, let's just say right here. So let's go back to April 15th. So if we go back to here, let's see if we can get this pull up a little bit. You see, look at the deaths per 100,000 right there. Be nice. Come on, plot leaf. Come up. And let's do it this way, a little closer this way. Yeah. So you can see right there the 3.32. So we're looking pre-pandemic lockdowns, mortality per 100,000. So if we go all the way back and we go over to here, and it's October 14th, where are we at? Including inoculations, including lockdowns, including everything else, we are about right where we started from. Food for thought, just to give you an idea. All right, again, algorithmically, this would make a great machine learning model. One, two, three, one, two, three. Let's see if that pattern follows in the future. All right, let's proceed. How's Florida doing? I'll just go straight to our other chart right here. Oh yeah, this one I show you, here we go. So we looked at Florida, remember Florida was supposed to fall off the face of the earth because of the Neanderthals. Now Texas has its, its challenges, no doubt about that, but we understand some of the, the reasons for that at the same time. But let's go down to today. You wanna see something interesting? So there's Florida. Florida has, da, da, da. all right. That is its deaths per 100,000, Florida, all right. California, right around that area there. So you're looking right there, pretty close. And that's with California with all its lockdowns and mandatory vaccines and everything else like that. So 0.29, California is slightly beating Florida. All right. And then New York at one per 100,000. So all this bemoaning of Florida the entire time. I mean, yeah, and you have Texas. And yeah, you could use selection bias and go, well, look at Texas. That's not the point. The point is, is the pandemic mitigation factors being incorporated by these states making a difference or is it just coincidence? Interesting about Florida, which is basically doing twice as well as New York currently is. And again, if we go back to the very beginning, obviously, you remember that? Yeah, so again, why? Don't know, but it seemed like there's Different patterns here and there, and I can't figure out why, but there it is. And then it just drops, and Florida's about doing just about as well as California. And again, uh, twice as well as New York. But you don't hear that in the media now, do we? All right, let's see what else. Do we have anything else here? Da -da -da. No, 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 just a bunch of pretty charts. Mutations, here we go. Mutations pop up. Come on, there we go. All right, here we are. No necessary correlations anywhere in negative or positive. Ooh, what's this? Uh, it's weekly ICU missions with new cases smooth per million. All right, big deal. All right, so let's go. Check this out. Now, this is just a correlation. Freaky, but just a correlation. People fully vaccinated per 100 correlating to total cases per million is now 0.9. That's just bizarre. Again, Delve into the data, validate exactly what I'm coming with. But we're looking at people fully vaccinated. You can go to our world on data, pull up the data, throw it into your own data frame, throw it into your own chart, and, and then make a comment below. I'd be really curious to see if you're getting the exact same data. Uh, this is correlation, not causative. But people fully vaccinated, the total cases per million, 0.9 correlation. I just skip everything else. Ba 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 ba. Pretty colors. Do do do. Here we go. I'm running out of show tunes. Going down to the bottom here. We're just going to skip over all that. All right, let's keep on going, keep on going for expediency and also to value your time. All right, here we are. Check this out. What's this say? Oh, I'm in the way. Total cases per million. Now, what we are looking at here, all right, just to give you an idea. This is fully vaccinated per 100 people as of October 16, 2021. So 71 to 100 right there means 
at least 71 to 100 people were vaccinated. So we look at this data right here, for example, these are our states, Portugal is pretty heavily vaccinated, United Arab Emirates, Singapore, so on and so forth. So there is our, our vaccination, um, you know, number of people vaccinated per 100. So we look at that and we go back to here. So here we are. So you get a, so you get a picture. So that's zero to 10, right? Can you show me anything that even looks like there's a correlation between inoculation and reduction in cases per million? Look at the reproduction rate, if you're into that. Show me. Exactly. I know there could be confounding factors. And that's perfectly fine. Tell me what the confounding factors are. What this I've done here is I pulled data. We look at these state, these countries here. It is on the human development index of 0.6 or greater based upon, you know, our world and data. And the vaccination rate's the same and with a population of 5 million or more. So I wanted to make sure I would compare as close to apples as apples. So that's the data. Population, 5 million or more, 0.6 or greater on the human development index. Total cases per million. Compare it to fully vaccinated 71 to 100, compare it to zero to 10. Give me a rationale. Deaths per million, zero to 10. You could say, well, it's not being reported. Well, that's why I picked the human development index of 0.6 or greater. So they, they could at least have reporting systems. But even if you go higher, show me some correlation that's, that's greater than don't have to even be 0.7, just make it 0.6, all right? Just show me a correlation that shows that inoculation has been effective uh, protocol. Um, there to that. How is this higher than that? And that's that's mortality per million. Reproduction rate. Reproduction rate was a big thing. Remember, they were about to shut down all of Britain. Look at that. 0 to 10. 71 to 100. Now, i give you a little bit there, but doesn't seem to compare it to those which are on a lower level. Case is smooth per million. Did they just give up in the 0 to 10 range? 20 to 20.53 compared to 148.13. And I don't know why we have this mid spike between the 40 and 49 range. That I have no clue. That's like so weird. But again, that's for other data analysts to look at. I'm just pointing in that direction. All right, and here's the, the countries per se. If you want to look, uh, scroll to that slowly, you know, as far as there's the United States, as far as fully vaccinated per hundred. And then did I do anything else? Oh, here we are. Ready? Check this out. All right. So let's look, let's look at the whole, the whole chart. Fully vaccinated per hundred. What I did here, the same chart, right? We go down this way. I kept it in alphabetical order. So this, the, this order is not going to change between the fully vaccinated uh, or per hundred. So, for example, Portugal, again, that's 86 people vaccinated per 100 people. All right, so let's look at the data as we go through. Total cases per million. Click on it one more time. Show me a correlation. There we are. It actually looks lower on this end than it does on this end. Let's go new cases smooth per million. There we are. Come on, smarty pants out there, data analysts and scientists and bioinformatics, biostatisticians, epidemiologists. Uh, give me a rationale. Come on, you can do it. Uh, look what happened with Singapore. And that's new cases smooth per million. Why is Singapore doing worse than Ukraine, Bulgaria, Belarus, Honduras, Bolivia, Russia, Laos, Jordan, you know, Poland, Brazil, Costa Rica, Peru. And Peru is quite interesting because they have Lambda. All right, let's look at mortality per million. Ready? Here we go. Here's Peru, mortality per million. That's because of Lambda. All right, and there there we go, down the line. It showed me a correlation. And let's proceed further. Again, it's just, again, not to bemoan it. I just, again, if you're asking people to uh, abdicate their personal sovereignty and autonomy, I expect a better argument. That's all from my personal, humble, minute uh, world. Give me a good argument. Give me one that actually uh, has efficacy in the real world. All right? I just, I'm not into the, I told you so. 
10 week trend variant USA, uh, trend USA. That's the variant that obviously Delta is overwhelming everybody. Mortality per million, keeping that number in mind, about close to five. Positivity rate, United States. Fully vaccinated, United States, we know. There's our chart. India, this is going to be a benchmark because we need our controls. Deaths per million, United States was at five. There's India. Positivity rate. Um, yeah. Inoculation rate. Yeah. Sweden. I enjoy Sweden, but again, we're not looking so much at the vaccines, which they are pretty well vaccinated uh, if you want to travel in Europe at all. But however, though, remember the lockdown measures. Remember the pandemic. Remember when Dr. Fauci went on things and said, well, we're not Scandinavia. Well, how's Scandinavia doing? A little bit of spike in deaths per million. The United States was five. S Sweden, 0.77. Positivity rate, 0.03, and then the inoculation rate is pretty high. And then let's go down to any new variants. All right, here we go. The latest reporting from October 15, 2021, if you're still with me, is Delta all across the board. All right, and then if we take Delta out of the picture, do we have any new variants emerging? Let's see. Oh, I think we have, what do we have here? Alpha in Cambodia. Uh, yeah, this is October 4th. Uh, alpha. So a little bit of alpha. Yeah. That's about our areas as far as uh, determining the, uh, the uh, growth. And do we have anything here of interest? Just alpha. Uh, anything new? ETA. Haven't heard of ETA. Let's keep an eye on ETA. Uh, in Nigeria, and then Mu. So there was Mu. Mu was in Chile. Uh, a little bit of Mu in the United States. Remember, remember, Mu was a big thing in the news a little while ago. So about one month later, no Mu. This is in the states. Any Mu here? A little bit of Mu in Chile. Um, a little bit of growth in Spain, but then in the United States, it just didn't look like it took hold. But again, if we go back down time, you can see exactly the evolution of the virus itself. All right, and I think there's nothing else in this area now. All right, then basically the web scraping. Doo -doo -doo. Let's look real fast. All right, we got this one done as far as file size comparisons. Do I have anything else for you here? That was the old chart. I'm moving more towards Plotly, if you're familiar with Plotly. That's a zip file size per year. Uh, submitted to VARES. And yeah, that's just that. And we'll keep that and then also too I promised you I have not got a chance to do yet I'm looking sentiment analysis through Twitter and if you look at here this is uh, my Twitter feed kind of boring possibly but also I'm noticing on Twitter as well what I want to try to do is next week we're going to try to pull out these freaking I'm um, uh, looking for bots so it's interesting because if we could find these bots on Twitter it would be quite enlightening. And often you'll see the same thing repeated over and over again. And it, it throws off the sentiment analysis, for those familiar with sentiment analysis is for natural language processing. But otherwise, again, from a small sampling, not having to pay to access Twitter itself, uh, we'll see if we can get a good idea what's going on. And again, Europe, no reason to report on that because for whatever reason, uh, your Dura Vigilance has not been updated since last week. So, um, We'll check out it. Most of the sentiment analysis, or it's for instance, Twitter, uh, to give you an idea, is very aggressive in the pro vaccine. Uh, so much so that it's almost antagonistic. So it's if you look at the pro vaccine sentiment statements in reference to um, uh, people that may have hesitation, it's quite uh, condescending and I would say on the verge of uh, intimidation or bullying. When you get an idea, we'll look to see next week if we see if we can pull anything up. But let's review and just close it out real fast at what we've done. Ba -ba -ba. There we go. It's been an hour. Oh, yeah, sorry. And now, good morning. It's 12.15 a.m. October 17th. So here we go. Da -da -da, we have covered going backwards. Ba -ba -ba. All right. Vaccines tend to wane pretty effectively. It looks like in reference to this particular study. And... Um, with Janssen and Janssen, that's even out there anymore, that climbed to 3%. So if that was your vaccine of choice after six months, I guarantee, probably shortly, I guarantee, not going to publish a bias. 
Well, even all of them. But when you start hitting below that 50% mark, that was the target mark for vaccine to even get at EULA. But after six months, uh, if it's even targeting the right aspect of the immune system in reference to their test, you know, something's up. But I guarantee policy will be changing a little bit in reference to um, uh, boosters galore. All right. And plus other countries too. Countries now for certain travel, you could be vaccinated, but then you have to be vaccinated within six months of traveling to that country again. And the thing of it is, it's tough to know enough to know the, the implications of one adverse event uh, reference to a vaccine, but to be revaccinated over and over and over again uh, and is, I don't know, again, uh, I'm not an immunologist, so that's up to them to debate. All right, and we've got a kick out of this. That's the immune system one. Uh, going to the Pfizer 2 and Pfizer, oh, this some, some things it just doesn't even compare to a natural infection, at least in reference to ba, 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 uh, the uh, no or low level of RBD and S specific immunoglobulin M's. And most of your vaccines now that are in development are looking towards a receptor binding domain as opposed to just the S yes proteins. All right, to proceed. Uh, we know about that as far as the crushing effect on healthcare workers. Um, the most adverse event reports, uh, most common ones in relation to each vaccine, I'll have the link for you there, uh, just so you can have the information. It's not negative or positive. It's just basically telling you what to expect or the likelihood of expectation. Uh, and they always, they always uh, profoundly tell people that honesty is the best policy in reference to uh, medical advice that don't be stuck on worrying about creating hesitation uh, and then discrediting your own credibility because that could hurt us much further down the road and also potentially deprive us of better inoculations. That's the whole point. All right, again, uh, immune response COVID-19 vaccine different with prior infection that we covered with reference to the T cells. Interesting. All right. Yes, there are problems in manufacturing from time to time. Just come to realization with it. It's, I mean, to improve the facility. How they got metal flakes in there? I think they hypothesized a reference to basically one of the production machines had an issue. But again, uh, is I mean, if the batches were being manufactured in Spain, did any other countries get the batch? See, and only Japan caught it, but yet. Where is the batch? Where did it go? Did it just go to Japan? I don't know. All right, to proceed. All right, incredible uh, reference to the British Medical Journal. I'll have this link for you again if you didn't catch it before in reference to um, the article presented by the British Medical Journal called COVID-19, How Independent with the U.S. and British Vaccine Advisory Committees, which the BMJ said, I think you need to look at that again. And then, quote, Again, the article, which had a lot of profound statements in reference to the hypothesis made in, reference, in regard to inoculation versus uh, natural infection. Vaccinated people who have had COVID-19, why does the natural immunity count in the U.S.? I don't know. Then we go to U.K. was advised to stockpile. That was an interesting uh, Nostradamus effect there four years ago. Actually, five years ago now. And then the British Medical Journal just basically giving a heads up that it's precautionary, but they are at least in these countries – they are concerned enough to at least put it on a hold and look at it until further data. I don't know why it's not both of them, but I guess they have a higher propensity in reference to the Moderna. And that was her rationale. But still, did anybody in the United States know about this? I mean, I know some news media outlets had it. I didn't see any news medias here in the U.S. Uh, uh, in reference to um, uh, basically batches which may have not been – up to par, uh, and has heard nothing in reference to the British Medical Journal's editorials in reference to them questioning certain uh, pandemic mitigation strategies. But that's for another time. Oh, and also too, by the way, just to close out real fast, uh, YouTube did ban one of my videos. They said it was medical misinformation. It was reference to aluminum and vaccines and hazard studies. And it was pretty, I don't mind them taking this video down because it was kind of like, um, it had kind of like a, a the soundtrack in there. It sounded, did you hear that? That basically was more like, um, um, sound more like, the, how would you describe it, The Exorcist. So it's kind of goofy. But I redid the video and I lowered the volume a little bit there. So I can't play it for you, the whole thing, but just get an idea. But however, though, however, though, 
they took this video down and this video was from 2015 and here's the citations which all I did was I added too much publisher bias in there so I think YouTube was definitely justified in this but you can find the same article or the same video which is the exact same information uh, in October, April 29, 2015, which they did not take down, a reference to um, metal and vaccines. Uh, particularly, again, it's not anti-vaccine. It is just, you see right here, it is just basically, uh, you know, you can use lactoferrin as an adjuvant now. Why, why are you back in the dark ages using aluminum to weaken a potential viruses or whatever it comes down to be? And these are the articles that were there as well, too, just to give you a heads up. But again, gratitude. Thank you. Gratitude, the researchers. I really, really respect the nobility of the British Medical Journal in basically questioning certain pandemic mitigation issues and bringing it to light fearlessly. And it's, it's important. But again, uh, information needs to be validated. Correlation is not causation. But as always, gratitude. Thank you. And I look forward to you all once again next week. All right. Catch you all in a bit. See you then. Bye.